Hello and welcome to the Cellador Australia. I'm George and I'm in Victoria where shortly I'll be heading to Heathcote to Sanguine Estate but first I'm in Bendigo to check out some of their gold mining history. Let's go. It's a brand new season, so to kick things off, we're in Victoria's beautiful Goldfields region, and I thought I'd head down to the local mine. Because after all, not only do I love wine, I'm a notoriously huge fan of gold and tunnels. Today, I'm off to the Central Deborah Gold Mine, right in the heart of Bendigo, where I'm catching up with Mine Operations Coordinator, Bill Allen. Hi, Bill. G'day, how you going? I'm great. This is the Central Deborah Gold Mine and you are going to show me around, is that right? Absolutely, let's go awesome. for a bit of a look around and I'll tell you a little bit about Bendigo's mining heritage. Sounds great. Where are we going, up here? Yeah, let's go up here, we'll have a look at the shaft. Okay, we're off to a flying start. So this is the original mine shaft. So this is how they got down? Yes, this is how the ground. miners would transport, so everything that came in and out of the mine, the miners, the quartz with the gold in it, all the materials Just for the miners, all down, all, down, all down in the cage. It's a bit of a squeeze, isn't it? Yeah. You could fit four miners into that cage uh -huh. and they would cram in at the start of the shift and then they'd be lowered down to the mine shaft. So this, this would have been going all day? Yeah, it would have been running all day long. Um, it's operated by a gentleman called the winder driver and he stands in the engine room, which is just behind us here. Would you like to go meet the winder driver? Oh yeah, Yeah, let's great. go for a walk, come okay. here this way. Awesome. So, Bill, this is the winder. This is the winding engine. Winding the engine, it's huge. It's pretty massive, isn't it? This yeah. is probably a medium size for the ones that were used in Bendigo. Right. Bendigo, at the turn of the century, had some of the deepest underground mines in the world. And they went down nearly 1,400 metres. So Bendigo was not only a mining centre, but it 1400 was 1,400 metres. metres, it's a fair way down. The miners working at the bottom of that were working in excess of 45 degree heat. Imagine working underground there for eight hours a day. That'd be I don't think I'd work anywhere in 45 no. degree heat. So not only the machinery, but also the engineering and the mining was very important. And Bendigo was a world leader of all that in the early 1900s with some of the deepest mines. This was actually made in Bendigo. It was made in 1896. So it's over 120 years old. And it still works. And it's still fully operational. I mean, so would you like to see it work? I would love to yeah. see it work. Let's take it for a run. <laughs> Pretty cool, isn't it? I've not seen many winches in my time, but this is definitely the biggest. It sounds like a steam train. That's from the... It pretty much runs off the same, same principle as a steam train. So as the engine as the engine and the drums turn, one rope goes down the shaft, takes one cage down, and then the other one hoists the cages up. So they work off a counterbalance. One goes up, the other goes down. All this winch action is making me thirsty. So this is the underground, this is where we get ready to go underground. Ooh. This is the mine experience tour. So we're gonna go 61 meters underground today. Okay. All this was especially built in the 1980s when the mine was reopened for underground tours. So this is this is newer technology. Yeah, so this is another bit of an add-on to the mine. After the mine closed in 1954, the mine were laid dormant for a number of years. They were hoping that the gold price would recover, but it did become economic to mine. Then in the 1980s, we found underground, we found a different type of gold, tourism. Are you really hosting a TV show if you don't ever have to pop on a helmet and a hairnet? <laughs> oh boy. Oh, all right, here we go. Ah! 
<laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you enjoyed that. <laughs> All right, welcome to level two. You're now 61 metres underground. That's quite deep. It is a fair way down. That's equivalent to a 40 storey building. 40 storey. Fair way down, isn't it? Yes. This is an ore truck. This is what the miners use. Oh, this is what all the stuff goes in. All the rock, so everything that came out of the mine, the quartz with the gold in it, the waste rock, the miners call that mullock. That's another more Cornish mining term. Uh -huh. All the rock would be loaded by hand. So the miners would shovel all the rock using picks and shovels, uh -huh. scrape the rock up, shovel it up, and load it into the trucks. And because of the wealth that was coming out of Bendigo, from mostly from its underground mining, Bendigo was known as Quartzopolis. Quartzopolis. Because it was so rich. <laughs> and a lot of that mining money actually went into the wine industry. Yes, so mm -hmm. after the, the gold rush of the 1850s, so the gold rush here in Bendigo peaked in 1853, after gold was discovered in 1851. Mm -hmm. After that, the gold started to run out around about 1854, 55. So, so it was only a couple of years. Of yeah, so it was a gold rush. It was in, in quick, get your gold and get out. And that's what a lot of people did. Some people made a little bit of money and a lot of them, that money, a lot of people took back to their, to their homelands. Mm -hmm. Some though decided to stay behind here in Victoria. They saw it as a new opportunity to invest in new industry. And one of those industries that came out of the gold rush in the 1850s was wineries. Mm. So some of the wineries that here in Bendigo and other areas, including Strathfield, say, and Heathcote outside of Bendigo, uh, have actually been established from, from wealthy miners that got, their, that got their money out of gold. Yeah, very savvy business people. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> Mm. Now this is the gold, oh. the quartz reef. Yeah, is there still gold in here? There's a little bit of gold left. Most of the old timers were pretty good. They mined most of the good they stuff got it, out. They got it. <laughs> there's a little bit left, including this. So this was actually not part of the original mine workings. This was added on for the underground tours in when we started opening up in 1986 for our first underground tours. And when we mined out the area for the tourists, we were lucky to find a, a little bit of a quartz reef that the miners didn't find in those days. So we've left a little bit behind so people can get an idea of what the gold looks like. See the gold inside the quartz? Mm -hmm. So only when we're underground, we've got to look for the white quartz. That's what and contains that was the gold. What the yep, gold. that's where the gold's been brought up and brought up with as a, as a liquid many millions of years ago. So it wasn't the fact that they ran out of gold, it was just they ran out of, um, out of profitability mm -hmm. and it just was no longer viable to, mm -hmm. work, to work the mine, including this mine. It was the second last mine in Bendigo to close in November 1954. And that brought an end to 103 years of continuous gold mining here in, here in Bendigo, from 1851 to 1954. Bill, I think it's time to head back to the surface. I think we made it to the end. You want to head back yeah. up? Yeah, that'd be good. Let's I feel go. like I've, I've earned myself a little uh, You've earned your pay? gold treat. Ah, very good. All right. Maybe a golden gay time. Sounds good to me. <laughs> your shout. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so Bill and I are off to the local milk bar for an ice cream. And once we're done, time to get back to business with a trip to Sanguine Estate. More after the break. Whilst filming the Salador in Bendigo, our crew chose to stay at Byron's Vale Vineyard and Accommodation Bendigo. The heritage two-storey stone stables at Byron's Vale offer three superbly restored and renovated self-contained apartments designed to provide all the comforts expected in fine accommodation. The stables are surrounded by picturesque farmland overlooking Bendigo's oldest Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon vines. For inquiries to purchase wine or to book your stay at Byron's Vale, head to byronsvale.com.au. Heathcote is a beautiful spot, just a short 90 minute drive north of Melbourne and one of the shining lights of the Heathcote wine region is Sanguine Estate. I'm about to catch up with Tony, Jodie and the rest of the family to find out more about what makes their wines so special. Tony, thank you so much for having me at your beautiful Sanguine Estate. Pleasure, George. Pleasure. Uh, we're overlooking your vines here, mm -hmm. which I believe you planted yourself. Do you want to talk me through the history of how this came to be? Yes, sure. Um, we as a family, that's uh, Mark and Jody and, um, and Lynn and I, um, bought this property in 1996. 
and it was a greenfield property, so there wasn't a vine on it. So none uh, of this was, was here? Then. None of it was here. The house certainly wasn't here. <laughs> so it was, um, it was a grazing property used for uh, cattle and uh, sheep and that sort of thing. So um, we bought this property because we felt it was in, the, in, a, in a prime place in Heathcote, surrounded by probably uh, the most um, iconic vineyards in Heathcote. Uh, and originally planted back in 1974-75. So I figured uh, that if, if those old vineyards had developed the reputation they had, uh, being in this area, then this was the area to be. So Was the, the intention then to create a, a brand and, you know, a big vineyard, or was it more of a something you wanted to dabble in? Um, originally, I'd have to say it was, it was more a hobby. Um, to give us a, a presence in country Victoria. Um, and I'm very much an outdoors sort of person and the whole family likewise. It was always though in my mind to build for scale. Right. So that if, if the rest of the family were wanting to go on with the business, at least we had uh, a good core to, to begin with. When Tony decided it was time to hand over the reins of Sanguine Estate, his daughter Jodie took over. So I thought I'd sit down with her for a chat. So Jodie, you are the CEO of the I company. I am, yes. The boss. Took over from Dad. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. And you're in charge now. Yes, I am in charge. I kind of like being the boss. Yeah. Boss my family around. <laughs> um, and speaking of family, yes. you sort of got the whole family involved in the business? Correct. Mm. So um, in the earlier days it included my husband as well. So mm -hmm. he was helping me with uh, the international sales arm uh, and also as, a, as an advisor. He has a financial and law background. So um, very handy to have a husband <laughs> <laughs> that has those qualifications. Uh, and Mark's wife, Melissa, uh, she's also uh, coming to the business and she manages the finances. So she's our CFO as well as uh, taking over bits and pieces from me as well, just to help me out. So she also looks after the wine club. Excellent. So it's great having her. Of course, yeah. then there's my brother and my, my mum and dad. So uh, yeah. a beautiful family business and we love working together. Yeah. You guys do pretty well in the awards department. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask you to list some of them, but I mean, it's oh, sort of <laughs> pages my, long. I know, my, my brother, and is incredibly talented and we're so, so proud of him. Um, but it also makes my job a lot easier <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he gets all these medals. So, so yes, he has, uh, he's won so many trophies and you're right, it's, it's difficult to count them. Plenty of gold medals. Um, internationally, he's won um, gold medals at the Hong Kong International Wine Show. Um, he's won trophies at the Shanghai uh, international wine show, so uh, incredible international accolades. Mm. Uh, the world's greatest Shiraz challenge. Yeah. That's been phenomenal for us. Um, and you've actually, like, there's been quite a few years where you've made it into, I'll let you the, <laughs> tell the stats, but it's very impressive. Yeah, the top 10. So um, over the last um, seven years, I think it is, that we've made it into the, the top 10 uh, of that particular show. And what's really important about that particular show, it's called Wine State's World's Greatest Shiraz Challenge, is wines that aren't normally entered into wine shows, which are iconic brands. So things like Penfolds Grange, Henschke Hill of, Hill of Grace. They also head over to, to France and they, they select wines from France that are very iconic in France. And uh, they put them against uh, small family boutique wineries, all in a For blind example. tasting, <laughs> yeah, like us. Um, and it, it is a true testament to uh, the quality of um, what family businesses can do in this industry. And whilst we might not have the iconic brand of a Penfolds Grange, we're, we're right up with them with, with quality. Um, in fact, Mark, with our 2012 Inception Shiraz, was equal first with the Penfolds Grange 2012. So that is phenomenal. Unbelievable. When we originally planted, we planted about 30 acres as a family. How uh, old were the kids For the Sanguine. Um, Mark was sort of 18. Jody would have been in her 20s. Uh -huh. um, Jody was, uh, I was st going, still going to uh, college at that stage. Uh, Mark was a bit unsure what he wanted to do and um, I think this has provided a fabulous opportunity for Mark to 
to really show his talents. Yeah, which, it was uh, either going to go one way or the other, I guess, after planting that many vines. <laughs> You're either yeah. going to be all about it or never want to go exactly near it. Exactly <laughs> right. But uh, after we'd planted the first 30 acres, um, Mark and Jody decided that they wanted their own wine business started. So uh, they asked uh, Lynn and I if they could have a 10 acre site within the estate. Uh, we said sure. So um, we gave them this vineyard here, which is... The best, the best block? Well, it's turned the... out to be... Uh, I, I thought it was the worst block in the whole property, <laughs> to be honest. We're doing and, uh, <laughs> So I wanted to keep the best for, uh, for the Sanguine brand, but um, as it turned out, uh, that particular block has consistently produced uh, wine that has gone into our top-end Dorset Shiraz. Hmm, we're halfway through this episode and I still haven't tasted any wine. Time for a glass or two with head winemaker and Tony's son, Mark Hunter. So, Mark, we have a selection of your delicious wines here. Yeah. Uh, which you made, obviously. Yes, I have, mm -hmm. yeah. I've made all these wines, yeah. It's um, a labour of love. Yeah. From <laughs> a very lovely. early age, speaking of labour, planting uh, the vines. Yeah, itself. yeah. Dad, Dad uh, convinced us it would be a great idea for us to plant our own vineyard <laughs> and that actually really planted the seed. We, uh, I know my sister and I, we liked wine but we weren't really into wine. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, when I was 18, 19. Mm. Um, and uh, Father said, you know, you can have your own little vineyard up here if you like. And so we, we went ahead and did that and that, that sort of, I guess, uh, we caught the bug after that and uh, it just rolled, it snowballed. We decided to, you know, start making wine from that vineyard and I loved sort of following that wine to the different winemakers in the early stages and then it just grew into, you know, we grew the business and made it bigger and bigger and my involvement got full on. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah, 20 years on. Yeah. Do you separate the vineyard side from the winemaker side or is it sort of all one and the same? It's for you? always, because I started that way, it's always been very much one thing. So, um, because, you know, my, all my previous experience was about viticulture. I went off and did viticulture at uni and, uh, um, and studied and focused on that. And obviously all we had was the vineyard to start with before it started producing grapes that we could make wine. So uh, it's, you know, it kind of just grew from, from the vineyard side of things. So yeah, and I'm still very much about the vineyard because, uh, God, it's a cliche, but you know, the, vin the wine is made in the vineyard. Mm. Um, and particularly when you're small like we are in boutique that uh, you really see that. Um, and it's very distinctive. You get so much vintage variation, you can see exactly what the weather does from one vintage to the next um, and how it affects your, your grapes. Um, yeah. So being a winemaker is just about kind of protecting what you do in the vineyard as much created. as you can in the, in the winery. Yeah, mm -hmm. letting that vineyard kind of express itself. In Shall we wines. see some expression? So this is the Dorsa, this is the oh, 2017 Dorsa, yeah. So um, this is our reserve wine and we've named it obviously after Pietro, the great great grandfather who, uh, uh, you know, as my father's talked about, immigrated and, and had his own little vineyard in, uh, in Molden, not too far away. Surprise vineyard. <laughs> yeah, surprise vineyard where the vineyard stone throws away. Um, so we decided to name this product after him. So this is our, I guess our um, longest aged wine. So this is, we, we recommend people to put this one away for, you know, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, the parcels that we use, it's normally about six barrels. So it's essentially the six best barrels in the winery. Mm -hmm. um, so there tends to be a bit of new oak involved in that too, because the most expressive barrels when they're young can be those new oak barrels. They're really vibrant, really lifted, and lots of character in them. Um, so we tend to use those in that, uh, in that blend. Um, so it's quite oaky, but it's really rich, powerful, uh, really expressive, um, a great expression of the vineyard mm. in a sense as well. So straight away you get that kind of really sort of cigar box kind of smell of oak yeah. and yeah, that nice rich fruit behind it. Yum. It just has an amazing length to it. Mm. Which I think that the sort of the oak tannins help that in a way, but um, it's just the sort of the, almost that purity of fruit that just lingers right through the palate. It doesn't hit you and then go away, or sort of hit you at the end. It's it's a really even palate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is it's what got I'm quite about. a juicy start. Yeah, it's got really silky. It's mm. it's almost like this sort of it's got a, a texture to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I when we when I first started in Heathcote, some of the wines that struck out to me. Um, and, and what stood out with Heathcote over other regions is that, that kind of a, 
You described it as like a creamy texture, but it's just texture. It's just that softness of the Shiraz, you know, fruit yeah. um, from Heathkit that I just love. Um, yeah, it's such a soft Shiraz. It's, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. For, for, for young wines, you can drink them young or they do age quite well. Mm. Um, and I just love that texture. So I've always focused on, particularly with that wine, and the inception is that texture. Um, we really work with that um, and try and choose parcels that have that, you know, that, that lovely softness to the palate. Mm. Mm. It's lovely indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, your history with wine, did you know the extent of your history when you started planting the vines or was that something you discovered? No, we, we discovered um, the involvement of my great grandfather in the cool wine story. industry. Um, we discovered that after we'd planted the vineyard. So and, you had no idea? Well, I, I had knowledge of Pietro Dorsa, his name was, Pietro Dorsa. Um, his daughter Angelina was my grandmother. So, and she lived with us for many years in our family home when we were growing up as kids. Um, so she would tell me stories about, um, about Pietro, her father. Um, Working but, on the vines? Well, or? no, she never actually got into that side of things at all. And it wasn't until, I think it was in um, 2000, when we were about to release our first wine, uh, that I was reading a book called Better Than Pomard and it was written by um, a David Dunstan and it, it was the history of winemaking in the state of Victoria going all the way back to the uh, 1870s and, and beyond um, and at that time uh, in the book in the back of the book was a um, the result of a census they did in 1890s I think it was um, a census um, detailing everybody who was registered as a vigneron in the state of Victoria and the acreage that they, they were looking after. And uh, I was scanning down the list and uh, I happened to see Pietro's name there, Pietro Dorsey. And I thought, what? <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea he was involved as he was in the wine industry. Yeah, that so must just be our, in your genes. Well, absolutely, sort of... yeah. You know, Swiss Italian, um, growing grapes in, uh, in Italy, northern part of Italy. Um, and old Pietro, when he emigrated here in 1869, he brought with him some uh, vine cuttings that he brought on the ship with him from Italy. Um, he tried <laughs> like his... wrapped in a bag? Or? Well, yeah, it was, they were wrapped in hessian and uh, they used to douse the hessian in, uh, in moisture, in water, to keep them green and, and growing and alive. And uh, he tried his hand at gold mining. Mm -hmm. um, he, when he landed here in 1869, he took a straight beeline to um, Malden in, uh, in near, near Ballarat there, uh, Bendigo, Castlemaine. And, um, gold country. Gold country, mm -hmm. in the Golden Triangle, mm -hmm. yeah. And they discovered gold there, in, I think, in the 1850s. And uh, Pietro had a cousin who was living in Malden and owned land in Malden. So when he arrived, he went straight to Malden, um, started gold mining with his cousin, uh, wasn't terribly successful, planted his vines and then propagated those vines over time until he had a reasonable sized vineyard. Crazy. And was making mostly fortified wines for the gold miners. Sanguine, which is our brand. Yes. Sanguine uh, has a reference to, to that to that history because that sanguine is blood. Mm, mm. Beautiful. And, um, but sanguine's also a temperament. It means confident, optimistic, glass half full, very positive attitude to life. Uh, and we think as a family um, that that is, that, that is our temperament, that is our personality. So um, the, the, the brand name just fitted in so well mm. and it fitted in with that blood in our, you know, the, wine makings in our blood through Pietro. So this is our 2019, a brand new release. This was only being bottled for a couple of months. Oh, wow. Yeah. Exclusive scoop. Yes. 
So Shiraz was the first grape that you really worked with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would have had um, maybe six years of my first, my first six vintages would have just been Shiraz and, and the Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, yeah, the Tempranillo I've been doing since ooh, 2004, I think. Okay. was the first one, so yeah, quite a while. Um, but of course the vines were young, now they're a bit more mature and um, you know, you're seeing a bit more complexity uh, and consistency now in, in the style. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, what I love about Tempranillo is that um, in contrast to the Shiraz, it's not as heavy, not as rich, so you see a little bit more kind of savoury nuances and um, you know, it's more like a smoky cherry, um, you know, a bit more in that sort of savoury sense um, and that, that cherry fruit rather than, you know, blackberries and mm -hmm. plum and those sort of things um, in the Shiraz. So, um, yeah, I find this a um, really lovely variety to make. Yum. Yeah, it's looking really good. Again, it's got a nice sort of um, spicy earthiness yeah. to it. Yeah, on the nose. And again, it's all natural fermentation, um, particularly with Tempranillo. It's, it's, we pick this at sort of 13, 13 and a half bone mate, so it's, it's, it turns out to be low so alcohol. And it's a half, what, sorry? Uh, bone mate, which is the, it's, it's the sugar reading which relates to the, uh, the resulting alcohol. Oh, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so 13 and a half will be 13 and a half percent alcohol. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Congratulations on such a phenomenally successful business and winery and a lovely family. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you so much me. for coming. We really appreciate you oh, being here. I'll be back. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> so good. I have had a blast here at Sanguine Estate, the first location of my whistle stop tour across the Heathcote wine region. There's plenty more to come, so be sure to catch our next episode. And if you'd like to catch up on any of our older adventures, you can do so on our YouTube channel. See you next time.